everyone. Good evening, uh, or maybe good morning or good afternoon. Uh, that, of course, depends on where you're joining us from. My name is Natalia Voronets. I'm an events manager at Prisma, and I would like to welcome you to this online edition of Serverless Berlin Meetup. Uh, I need to I need to stop my spiel here. I hope you folks cannot hear the bells of the church that just started ringing for uh, for 6 p.m. Um, I knew this would happen, but I kind of forgot that this is the time. So I'm just hoping it doesn't disturb the audio very much. Coming back to the subject at hand. Uh, I would love to be welcoming you from an uh, on-site location here in Berlin, uh, but for the time being, uh, let's make the best uh, with what we have. And we actually have a lot. So with this edition, we are bringing you some of the biggest stars of the serverless world. And um, here I was trying to come up uh, with a pun for this occasion. Um, so I had uh, the brightest stars of the cloud in mind, but it is not the best pun. So please, if you have a better pun in mind uh, for this occasion, let me know in the YouTube chat and I will use it later uh, because that's just not the best. Uh, enough with the pun talk. Uh, let's move on to the agenda. I'm gonna share screen. Yes, perfect. Um, the, meet, uh, the first speaker of the meetup is Jan Twain. Uh, then Alex Simovic uh, will take over and Eitor Lessa will round it up nicely. A fun fact that is worth mentioning now is that all the speakers of today's meetup are pretty good friends in life. Uh, so yeah, it just seems like the serverless world is um, indeed like a small and tight-knit circle, uh, which I found very wholesome. Moreover, Jan and Alex were in the first cohort of AWS Serverless Heroes back in 2018. Our experts will, of course, be open to questions, so you can drop them in the YouTube chat and we'll have um, like a designated section for that um, after the talks. Um, moving on to the raffle. So we are hosting a raffle today. We will be giving away four books uh, in today's raffle. To enter, please put in your name and uh, email address or however else you would like to be contacted in the link that will be shared in the YouTube chat um, shortly. So after I go off screen. Uh, the serverless applications with Node.js book uh, has been co-offered by Alex, so one of our today's speakers, and the serverless architecture on AWS is co-offered by Jan, uh, who we will also welcome to the stage very shortly. The latter is available in MEAP, M-E-A-P, and uh, that is Manning Early Access Program. Uh, so it is uh, partially still work in progress, uh, with final publication expected in March this year. Uh, Manning has also very generously shared a 35% discount code for older books uh, with us. So you can use it on ebooks, you can use it on hard copies, all, uh, everything goes. And the code is uh, MTPServeBE22. That doesn't roll off the tongue very well. Uh, so I will also share it in the chat later so everybody can um, take advantage of it. And yeah, uh, in case you were wondering, because I was, uh, about the book covers, the lady on the serverless applications cover is wearing a traditional Serbian outfit from two centuries ago. And the gentleman on the serverless on AWS is rocking a Croatian outfit from the similar time period. So that's about the uh, story behind the covers of the books. And another raffle prize, the grand prize, it is uh, access to AppSync Masterclass by Jan. And who else might uh, introduce the course better than Jan himself? But first, let me introduce Jan. So the announcements are out of the way. And the first speaker of the day uh, probably doesn't need much of an introduction. Jan True is known by many as Jan, the serverless man. And he has been one of the biggest names in the serverless scene for many years now. He is a consultant and an AWS serverless hero. I am now bringing Jan to stage. Where are you, Jan? There we go. Hey, Jan. Hey, Hello. Thank you very much for joining us. It's an honor. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be here. Hey, Jan. So uh, can you tell us a couple of words about the course that people can win in uh, today's raffle? 
Yeah, sure. It's a, uh, it's, it's the Apting Masterclass. It's a course that I've been working on for more than a year now. Uh, essentially, you learn how to use uh, AppSync and Lambda and DynamDB. Uh, essentially, build an entirely serverless backend uh, for a Twitter clone. And there's also going to be a friend of mine, the Gerard Sanz, uh, who's uh, going to be uh, teaching yeah. you how to build it. I know, know Gerard. Gerard, yes, I know oh, yeah, him yeah. from other areas, yes. Uh, yeah, he's so very he's, he's, so the... he's my uh, co, uh, co-conspirator. Uh, he, <laughs> yeah, awesome. he does all the front-end lessons uh, in the Apps Masterclass and shows you how to build a clone of the, of the Twitter front-end uh, using Vue.js as well as uh, using Tailwind uh, CSS. Um, so I've been learning a lot from, uh, from him as well in terms of how to do front-end projects properly. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, this uh, this uh, course would uh, give you a lot of ideas in terms of how do you build a full stack application. Um, you know, it covers everything you want to you need to know about AppSync in terms of uh, the basic GraphQL schema, uh, uh, subscriptions, how to do security, and uh, how to do caching, uh, observabilities, and all of that good stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's a quite comprehensive course that we have maybe a 40 hours of content in total, oh, and it's taken us a really long time to put together. So I really hope that you enjoy it. Amazing. Uh, so folks, once again, you can win this course in our raffle and I will share the link to the raffle in the YouTube chat very soon. Uh, so Jan, are you ready to share your screen? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Just uh, give me one sec and I'll share my screen. Okay, so let's Ooh. see. Okay, yeah, we can see the screen. We got it. And there we go. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some of the lessons I've learned from uh, running AppSync in production. Um, okay, so, so I'm going to make myself scarce uh, and give you the stage here, Jan. Bye-bye. Cool. I'll Thank see you in a moment. Yeah, so my name is Jan. I've been working with AWS for more than 10 years now. I guess my first project running stuff on AWS was uh, back in 20, 2009. Uh, and nowadays I'm an AWS serverless hero, and I also uh, work with Lumigo as a, as a developer advocate. Uh, and Lumigo is uh, probably, the, is, I think, hands down the best observability tool for serverless applications. And the other half of my time, I work as an independent consultant where I uh, help other companies adopt serverless. And sometimes that means advice, sometimes it's training, sometimes I go ahead and uh, deliver uh, a project for the client. And uh, in the la in that in, that, in my capacity as a consultant, I worked on three separate projects in production uh, with AppSync in the last eighteen months. Uh, so it spans across multiple sectors, including social network, a healthcare app, as well as a document assembly app. Uh, all had some interesting pieces things to business um, sort of angle and multi tenancy requirements. And uh, all three of the projects are pretty big, as you can tell from the number of resolvers involved in those AppSync APIs. And the stack for this uh, project pretty much consists of AppSync, Lambda, and uh, DynamoDB. And I've used uh, Cognito and of zero for authentication. And for search, Algolia is my preferred choice. Uh, but for the healthcare app, because of HIPAA requirements, we actually ended up going with uh, Elasticsearch instead. Uh, and all three of the projects, I used uh, Lumigo to help me debug and troubleshoot the application really quickly. Uh, and here are some of the lessons I've uh, picked up, which I think has been really important in helping me, you know, getting things running in production reliably. I think the first and arguably the most important lesson is that uh, you should be using Lambda resolvers as the last resort, because AppSync lets you write resolvers that reads and writes data from data sources like DynamDB using VTL templates, where you can say, you know, what operation you want to do and the parameters you want to use. I know VTL is not the most easy to use programming language, but honestly, I don't think you have to write uh, a lot of VTL code anyway. Most of the time, you're just writing a JSON blob that describes the DynamDB operation that you actually want to do. Of course, sometimes you do need a bit more help. You do need a bit more control so you can stick a Lambda function in there and you can use that to implement more complex business logic, you can uh, use it to call third-party APIs uh, with their own CD, uh, SDKs. And uh, maybe you want to just leverage the built-in retries you get uh, as well as the exponential backoff uh, you get with the AWS SDK when you use it to call other AWS services so that you can make your application more resilient to you know, temporary issues, uh, uh, latency issues from those other AWS services. Um, or maybe you want to implement some kind of a circuit breakers or fallbacks in case uh, there are problems with, say, DynamDB, and you want to fall back to some um, other services that you may want to use or fall back to some static data that you can return instead. 
Um, and sometimes you may want to just do more than one thing, like getting an item from the database and then update it and then save the changes back to the database. So those are multiple steps you have to do that you can easily capture in the Lambda function. You can, of course, also do that using pipeline functions, uh, but we can talk more about that later, especially if you've got questions around uh, how does uh, pipeline functions work and some of the tips I have uh, for working with them. Now, adding a Lambda function also adds another source for latency for your resolvers, especially when you consider the fact that you are going to see cold starts from, uh, from sometimes. Even if the traffic in production usually keeps your functions warm so that it's not nearly as bad as some people might suggest. But when you have nested resolvers, those Lambda cold starts can actually stack up. And that's where I find the things can get a bit ugly where you have the first resolver calling Lambda, you get a cold start, and then you've got nested resolvers calling other Lambda functions, and you see more cold starts, and they start to stack up. And that's where you're going to get really bad uh, latency, uh, latency instead. It's also another thing that you have to pay for, for both the Lambda requests, as well as the amount of time that your functions run for. And you have to worry about you know, regional concurrency limits, which uh, applies to all the functions running in the region, including functions that are not part of your AppSync API. So I think for these reasons, for simple CRUD operations, you just shouldn't use Lambda resolvers at all. And instead, you should go straight to DynamDB from AppSync using VTL templates. Because uh, it's going to be, it's going to end up cheaper, it's going to be faster, it's going to be more scalable. And I think it's also just simpler as well when you don't have to write and configure a Lambda function for every resolver and all the things that comes with having a Lambda functions, including setting up IEM roles and so on and so forth. Um, quite a few people, though, have told me that they don't like this approach because they end up writing a lot of VTL code and the VTL is not their favorite language. And I think this kind of stumped me a little bit when I first heard it because it's the opposite of my experience. Even though I use VTL templates a lot, I don't actually end up writing a lot of VTL code. And it turns out that pretty much everyone I spoke to who complained about the amount of VTL code they have to write, they were using single table designs with DynamoDB, which brings me to my second lesson that you really don't need to use single table designs. In fact, I think when it comes to using with AppSync, it's preferred not to use it. And uh, let me explain. And in case you haven't heard about single table design, it's basically a collection of practices and uh, modeling techniques that solve the problem of joining data when you use DynamoDB by pre-joining the data into collections in a single table. So imagine you've had, uh, say, a users table and an orders table, and you want to build a UI page that shows the user profile alongside the user's orders. So you have to make a get item request to the users table to get a user, and then you have to make a query request to the orders table to get the orders that belong to this user. So that's two separate DynamDB requests. Whereas uh, if we have put both users and orders into one table, and then use some clever schema to squeeze the user IDs and the order IDs into these opaque primary and the sort keys, then you can use one DynamDB query to get both the user and the orders by looking for the, uh, the primary key of user number one. And uh, you look for the sort key, which is either user or it starts with order hash, and then you, in this case, you'll be able to get both the user and his orders in one request. And then you have to, of course, split the result uh, into in your code so that you get the user and then the orders. Which, if you think about it, it's actually pretty clever, right? And there are lots of other patterns that can help you model one-to-many uh, or even many-to-many -many relationships inside a single table. But the fact that it's clever also means that there's a lot of um, there's a bit of a learning curve to it, especially for people who are new to DynamoDB. And I think it's generally speaking not good for greenfield projects because once you've modeled all of these uh, access patterns into your schema, you've created all of these uh, indexes, it's not easy to change those access patterns. And it can actually be quite difficult to add new ones later on as well as you discover and evolve the application, you're learning, okay, the access pattern we store we're gonna have actually turn out not to be the case or we're gonna need new ones. And the way, you know, if you have uh, one table for each entity, you can also use the uh, cost tags to track the cost for individual tables. 
and monitor the usage by uh, usage cost by uh, entity. You can't do that with single table design because all the data access is coming and going to one table. And the funny thing is, the issue of joining data is basically a non-issue with GraphQL and AppSync because the user and the orders can be handled by two separate resolvers. Each one's gonna fetch data from different table and AppSync is gonna join the data for you for the response. So you don't actually have to do very much yourself. I mean, AppSync is kind of just solving and GraphQL is kind of just solving the data joining problem for you. That being said, I do think you should learn about single table design and understand the modeling techniques so that you can use them where they actually make sense. I just don't think you should uh, go around making a region out of it and uh, literally put all of your data into a single table because it's just going to make your life more difficult than it really needs to be. And uh, when you use the uh, single table designs with, VT uh, with uh, AppSync, you do end up writing a lot more custom VTL code in order to construct those um, uh, funky uh, primary key and sort keys. And also you have to split the result, uh, the data in the response that are the, in the response template to get the user and the, uh, and the orders data separately and then, com and then combine them together again in the response temp in the VTL response template. Um, advocates for a single table design might also say, well, but what about the cost savings you're gonna have? Um, fetching multiple entities for with one query is going to be cheaper than multiple individual get item requests. While that is absolutely true, however, those cost savings are only going to amount to anything that's even worth thinking about when you're running at scale. For Amazon, it absolutely so out there the cost of engineering time that's involved with using single table designs and other all the extra complexities is going to far outweigh the done and the savings that you're going to get by orders of magnitude. Besides, if you're really concerned about cost, then I think caching is a much better strategy to save on down to be cost. So in one of our pre, uh, projects that I worked on uh, that went to production, we managed to achieve an average of 99% cash hit rate. And at the end of the first month when we went live and we got like over 25,000 monthly active users, our Dynamo DB cost was really, really low. And um, most of the requests was being handled by the cache, which has another good side effect in that uh, caching makes the API fast. Our 99% uh, our latency was uh, you know, well below 20 milliseconds. 20 milliseconds. So um, the customer was really happy, the fact that you got this API that's fast and the running cost was really low. So speaking about caching, uh, AppSync supports uh, caching out of box, and uh, you can choose between having full request caching or per resolver caching. And I think the, the lesson here is that you should pretty much always go with per resolver caching because the full request caching is just not very efficient at all. So if you take this GraphQL request to fetch your timeline from say a Twitter clone, like the one you built if you were to take my AppSync masterclass, um, with full request caching, AppSync is going to cache the response against this entire request, and it's going to use the argument as well as the, the, the identity of the caller as the cache key. And this is not going to get you very far because in the example here, a user's profile can appear in many, many tweets and show up in many users' timelines. And even though this user's profile probably hasn't changed for a long time, we're still going to fetch it from the database many times, once per caller, per unique request, based on the arguments, which is, uh, in this case, uh, a limit of 10 and the next token of no. And similarly, this tweet that's going to show in my, that's going to show up in my timeline is going to show up in many users' timeline, timelines, but each user is going to fetch data from the database which you know, think about it, it's just gonna be really inefficient. You're just gonna keep getting the same data from database over and over. Whereas uh, with uh, per resolver caching, we can enable caching for individual resolvers. It could be at the top level, it could be one of the nested resolvers. So in this case, once I've got a tweet, I've got a nested resolver to hydrate the, uh, the profile for the creator of the tweet. And I can enable uh, caching for the individual resolvers that gets, inv uh, that gets invoked along the way. And I can also choose a different time to live value for each of those uh, uh, um, resolvers as well. 
So in this case, I can choose to use the profile ID for the profile as a cache key. And so that after the first user has fetched this profile as part of a request to get his, uh, get his timeline, any other user would get the profile from the cache until the TTL value expires, which is going to be far more efficient from a caching perspective. And this is the sort of thing that's going to help you get a really high cache hit rate in terms of uh, uh, your overall caching strategy. In general, you want to cache data that doesn't change very often, and you want to cache them for everybody. And doing this is going to be a big part of uh, a good cache uh, strategy. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that even though it's possible to flush the apps in cache, if you want to clear the entire the whole cache, then there is a control plane API you can call to just clear the entire cache. But if you want to uh, flush individual items in the cache, you will have to do it via a VTL resolver. Now, the use case for this is, say, if you want to delete a previously cached response during a mutation operation. But if you need to, say, delete some cache response from, say, like a background process, then you have to add mutations to your GraphQL schema just for that and make sure that it's only um, accessible by the background process by, say, using Amazon's uh, IEM authentic authorization method for this mutation. And when you have uh, cache enabled, every virtual machine in the AppSync fleet for your API is going to mean it's going to open and maintain a persistent connection to some underlying Redis node. And the creating this con uh, this connection pool has a latency overhead, which you're going to see from time to time. And in my experience, it's going to add about one to two seconds to the request latency. Now this happens very in, in, uh, very infrequent, um, infrequently. But it happens at least once per virtual machine inside the AppSync uh, uh, fleet that is serving your API. And if you have X-ray enabled, then you can see this uh, this time in the X-ray traces. Unfortunately, though, this time to initialize the cache pool, um, sorry, the connection pool for uh, for Redis is not labeled in X-ray. So all you see is a big gap of time where nothing is happening. At least it looks like nothing is happening. But under the hood, the AppSync uh, virtual machines are going to Redis and creating a connection pool. So moving on to lesson number four, um, you definitely don't want to leave the field resolver log level setting to all when you go to production because it's going to get really expensive really quickly. If you go to the logging session on your AppSync settings page, uh, you can choose the, you can set the field resolver log level between none, error, and the all. The problem is that these choices are basically having close to nothing, uh, or having nothing close to nothing, or having logging down to 11, because when you set it to all, you're going to get a lot of logs, including the input and output for every resolver and how much time the resolver took, as well as the, the context the value that was uh, uh, that was used for each resolver execution, which is great for debugging. You can find all kinds of problems this way. However, it's also going to get really expensive really quickly because all of these logs are going to CloudWatch logs and it's being charged at the 50 cent per gigabyte for ingestion alone. And if you're going to keep them around for a little bit, then that's also a three cents per gigabyte cost per month uh, per gigabyte for storage. So you definitely, definitely don't want to leave the field resolver log level setting to all when you go to production because the cost of those logs in CloudWatch can be prohibitive. But if you're like me and you want to have the cake and eat it too, uh, then check out this blog post I wrote a while back, which explains the workaround that I used, where I used a pair of cron jobs to change the resolver log level between error and all, uh, so that I get about maybe three minutes worth of uh, detailed logs for every hour. It's not a great workaround, honestly, but it's the best one I can think of, where I can still get some benefit of the, those detailed logs uh, without overwhelming, um, you know, having an overwhelming amount of logs in CloudWatch and uh, create a cost problem for my application. And uh, going on to lesson number five is that uh, you need to have a way to handle use errors more gracefully if you don't want them to trip your Lambda alerts constantly and get woken up in the middle of the night because of that. So with HTTP, you've got HTTP 400 status codes that represent the user errors, and you've got 500 codes that represent system errors. If our system is not working, we definitely want to be alerted so we can fix them quickly. 
On the other hand, if users are making mistakes and sending bad data to our API, then it's something that we want to keep an eye on because maybe our UX is not great and it's making our users uh, do silly things. But it's not something that we want to, we need to deal with uh, urgently. And it's definitely not something that I want to be woken up in the middle of the night because uh, some users in the US is using my application and sending uh, invalid or wrong data. When you're building REST APIs with API Gateway and Lambda, you can do your validation and then return 400 errors uh, as a response. So the Lambda invocation was successful, but it lets us tell API Gateway to respond to the caller with a 400 error or 400 status code. With AppSync, however, there's no way for us to tell AppSync to return a 400 error from a Lambda resolver. If we detected that there's some, there's some user error, all we can do is to throw an error from the Lambda function, which AppSync is going to capture and it's going to include the error, um, error, error message uh, in the response, which is great. The problem is that it also fails the Lambda invocation, which is going to trigger any alerts that we have on Lambda invocation errors. And what you can do instead is to return a payload from your Lambda function that captures the error information where it's applicable and then use a custom VTL response template uh, with your Lambda invocation, with your Lambda resolver to check if the Lambda response includes an error object. And if so, you can throw an error in the VTL response template instead. That way, the Lambda invocation is fine, it's successful, but we're still able to fail the resolver with an error. So moving on to lesson number six, you need to have a plan for the 500 resources limit in a cloud provision stack because an AppSync API has a lot of resources. You've got resolvers, you've got data sources, you've got IAM roles, and for Lambda resolvers, you also have the Lambda functions. Each one of them is gonna have its own IAM role, hopefully, so that you can tailor the permissions for the individual functions, and it's gonna have its own CloudWatch log groups and all of that, so you're gonna hit that 500 resource limit at some point, probably a lot sooner than you hope. Luckily, there's a solution for this, uh, which is to use the uh, nested stacks. Each nested stack can have up to 500 resources. So that can significantly raise the ceiling for how many resources you can have in the project. And if you're using the serverless framework, there's a really handy plugin called the serverless plugin split stacks, uh, which you can use. And the nice thing about this plugin is that you don't need to change your project structure the plugin is gonna move resources into nested stacks and update the references so that all of your ref and uh, get attribute references will still work as if everything was in the same stack. But you need to make sure that, uh, you need to take care and make sure that uh, you don't have circular references between the root and the nested stacks. This plugin allows you to write a custom script to decide where each resource will go so you can use a custom script to split the resources in a way that doesn't create uh, those uh, circular references. And uh, in my current project, uh, I was able to split my pre-gigantic stack into over 50 nested stacks and the individual stacks still doesn't have that many resources. So it still leaves plenty of room for me uh, to grow this project going forward. And the last lesson is uh, about uh, how do you then go about modeling multi-tenancy with Cognito because this seems to be a really common requirement and uh, a lot of the apps seem to have this kind of requirement, especially if you're building any sort of like business to business application, um, this is gonna be really relevant for you. So where, where you need to model for like multi-tenancy, you need to model uh, having tenants and users and users belong to a tenant and each user has uh, one or more roles, which limits them to some subset of the actions that the API supports. Um, not every single sort of, you know, multi-tenancy situation works like this, but this is a really common and recurring, uh, uh, I guess, pattern I'm seeing. So the simplest way to model this with Cognito User Pool, with AppSync, is to use the user groups to model the different roles you have, and then to capture the tenant ID as a custom attribute, so that in your GraphQL schema, you can limit access to specific actions to some subset of the roles by adding this decorator to your GraphQL schema. And uh, that's it, <laughs> you're pretty much done. AppSync is gonna handle the rest. So in this case, um, only the users that belong to either the admin or the super user group uh, will be able to call this add user mutation. And to stop user from being able to somehow uh, gain access to other tenants data, 
you should also never accept tenant ID as an argument in your GraphQL schema. Instead, you always, always want to take the tenant ID from the context of identity object, which is the identity of the user or, or the caller, which has been resolved and verified by Cognito. So nowhere would you take a tenant ID as an argument for GraphQL operation and allow users to access tenant ID that maybe they don't own and trust a user to, to give you their own tenant ID. So it's always, always coming from the user's resolved and uh, verified identity. Um, so as a sum summary, here are the seven lessons we've covered today. Uh, number one, probably the most important one, is that uh, you want to prefer uh, use uh, VTL templates over using Lambda functions. And uh, you don't need to use uh, single table designs with DB when you're doing stuff with AppSync. In fact, I would say you shouldn't use a single table design when you're working with uh, AppSync and DynamDB. Um, and uh, in terms of caching, uh, always use uh, per resolver caching because the per request, the full request caching, just not very useful at all. And uh, when you go to production, make sure that you change the field resolver log level so that it's not set to all. And uh, in production, you also want to handle user errors gracefully so that they don't trip your Lambda error alerts and then wake you up uh, because users are sending you bad data. And you also want to plan ahead and think about what you uh, what you would do uh, when you get to when you eventually hit that uh, 500 resources limit uh, with CloudFormation and uh, where you need to mo uh, model multi tenancy. Then with Cognito, uh, then you want to use uh, user groups to model the roles and then capture the tenant ID as a custom attribute. And that brings me to the end of this talk. I want to thank you guys. Thank you guys uh, for being with us this evening. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I spend most of my time as an independent consultant. So if you want to see how service can help you go faster or want to get some help up, uh, upscaling your team, then let me know and go to the burningmonk.com uh, to see how we can work together. Um, so we're going to ruffle out a copy of my uh, AppSync Masterclass. Um, so if you're the lucky winner, uh, let me know afterwards. I guess uh, uh, maybe Natalia will let me know afterwards. Uh, and if you want to just check it out, go to AppSyncMasterclass.com. Uh, so again, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Jan, thank you very much. Enough of screen sharing now. Let's take that down. There, beautiful. Thank you very much for that wonderful slides as well. Very insightful. Thank you. Are you ready to take some questions? Yeah, absolutely. So, I see you got a question. Yeah, uh, we have a question from Jones. Uh, for complex resolvers, what is recommended, VTL pipelines or Lambda FNS? Yeah, so for complex uh, workflows, uh, you can use uh, either pipeline functions or you can use uh, just write a Lambda function. Uh, I think in most cases, it's just easier to write a Lambda function, um, except for case, I think, I think where uh, pipeline resolvers is really powerful, is uh, it's very useful, is in implementing uh, cross-cutting concerns. So one example could be, let's see, I had the, one of the applications I had that we had the really complex, a more complex uh, so multi-tenancy scenario where a uh, user can belong to multiple uh, organizations or tenants. And depending on the, that's like a hierarchy of the organization, you've got parents and child, and depending on which uh, for different for the same user they may have different roles at different organizations at different points of the organization hierarchy. So the sort of uh, the sort of permission set is really complex. We couldn't just use a, a community user group to implement that. So to do the, a lot of validation, we use the pipeline resolvers uh, so that every action, every um, uh, GraphQL request, I uh, have to run this pipeline resolver, which then triggers another lambda function to then uh, run a bunch of more sort of complex uh, validation to make sure that you are actually allowed to do this particular action against this particular data based on your role in your roles inside the organization hierarchy. Um, another example would be, so uh, for one of the healthcare apps I built, uh, we because it's under, it falls under the um, US uh, HIPAA requirements, which requires you to have uh, uh, audit logs for every you know, request and response so that you know what data has been accessed and by whom and when. So there's no way to do that with AppSync out of the box. So instead, um, uh, we, uh, we wrote a little pipeline resolver to Output every uh, like all the, the entire response uh, to uh, um, to to, uh, to somewhere so we can capture that and uh, in the and, and save them in S3 so that uh, we can then use that uh, later if we need to go through an audit process. 
And the trick with the pipeline resolver is that when you use them for cross-cutting concerns, you end up having to in, uh, sort of insert them into mm -hmm. your every single resolver, which uh, when you've got hundreds of resolvers, it can be just you know, a lot of manual work. So right. what I ended up doing was uh, we wrote a little um, uh, server single plugin that inspects the, the, the CloudFormation stack and then we write it to turn every single resolver into a pipeline resolver if it wasn't already, and then inject the resolvers that we want to do, uh, say in the before or the after of the main uh, resolver that we have in there already. Um, so uh, in terms of just having more like uh, um, uh, one res uh, resolver that you want to do some more complex things, I think in most cases, uh, I would go for a Lambda function because it's just easier to manage and maintain. Right. Um, also, Robert uh, had a question. Jan, have you met uh, with some limitations when using AppSync and resolvers? How do you ensure that resolvers using VTL are working properly? I'm thinking about testing them. Yeah, so with AppSync, there's a couple of limitations. I think one of the big ones uh, for a lot of the large organizations is that the, there's no... Um, so with GraphQL, uh, well, maybe not GraphQL, but with, uh, I guess, the Prisma guys can probably tell you later, uh, with some of the uh, GraphQL implementations, you have custom spec uh, that support things like a schema stitching or some kind of mechanism that allows you to split one GraphQL uh, API into multiple APIs. Um, AppSync doesn't support that, which makes it uh, pretty much that you know, when you want to have one um, one API entry point, uh, then you have to have um, uh, one AppSync API that you know, sits behind that GraphQL schema. So that means that when you want to separate them into different teams on a different part of that graph, it becomes more difficult. So that's probably the biggest uh, um, problem as uh, well, limitation right now. The way people work around it right now is just having multiple GraphQL APIs uh, if they need to, and then uh, um, no, the, the front end will use the multiple GraphQL APIs in that case. Uh, in terms of second part of your question, how do you test the VTL templates? So one of the things I've, I've, I have show in my AppSync Masterclass is uh, how to write unit tests uh, using some of the open source libraries that the Amplify team publishes, which allows you to essentially run a simulation uh, against your VTL template so that you can check, OK, based on this context object I'm, um, I'm, I'm supplying, um, and this template, uh, I've got VTL template, I've got what does it translate the template into so that I can check after the, um, you know, when that, uh, you know, once done, uh, that is, you know, is at, so for example, if I'm constructing, um, I'm, do, I'm doing single table, single table design, I'm constructing this uh, uh, this funky uh, uh, priming key and sort keys, you know, I can then check with the unit test that that, that transformation happens correctly. Very insightful. Um, there's another question from Tim. Uh, have you ever encountered a situation where AWS Cognito was not good enough? Yeah, quite a few times now, actually. Um, Cognito is uh, is great in that it's, uh, it's got this uh, nice integration with um, AWS services like AppSync and uh, API Gateway, uh, but it's also quite, well, it's, it's definitely not developer uh, friendly. Uh, its documentation has got really bad, but uh, <coughs> Quite a few cases, uh, things like uh, MFA um, doesn't do out of the box uh, and a few other things like that, uh, which has kind of pushed me towards uh, off zero instead, which is quite a bit more expensive than, uh, than Cognito. The main thing about Cognito that makes it really good are the integration that you get out of the box and the fact that it's really cheap. Um, for things like off zero and other things like that, uh, you probably end up paying a lot more money uh, compared to Cognito. All right, um, Jones has another question, and uh, maybe we can okay. take that one uh, short so that we don't run out of time. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, best way to test and debug VTL resolvers. Any hacks or tips? Um, I think, uh, in t um, so I tend to write a lot of end-to-end -end tests uh, for my GraphQL APIs. Uh, for VTL templates, if the VTL template itself is just like a JSON blob to say, do a down if you get, I don't tend to write any unit tests for them because I don't think there's a lot of return on investment on those. Uh, but where I'm doing more detailed, uh, well, more data transformation type of things, uh, business logic in the VTL template, then I'll write unit tests uh, using the approach I mentioned. Um, Whereas for the other uh, uh, other sort of VTL resolvers, uh, um, resolvers, sorry, not VTL, uh, other sort of resolvers for Lambda. So anything I'm doing with Lambda, uh, Lumingo gives me a lot of visibility in terms of what's actually going on inside the function. Uh, is the uh, but the other VTL plates uh, that I'm doing, um, I tend to write a lot of end-to-end -end tests for them instead of uh, a unit test. 
So I will write this, a scenario where user logs in, uh, go to my timeline, and then uh, write, a, uh, write a new tweet. And then he's able to then um, fetch his new tweet back from his uh, uh, timeline page, that sort of thing. Thank you for that. Uh, what else is happening in the chat? So Paul has some very kind words about, about your course. Also, <laughs> thank you. Evening, thank I you. only recommend checking out Jan's course, incredibly detailed. <laughs> Fantastic value. I'm learning a lot. So very kind words from Paul. Tal is saying good vibes, good vibes back to you, Tal. I think that's uh, that's supposed to be an emoji. No, that's just not. Uh, that's just not loading. Anyway, good vibes to you. And yeah, everybody's uh, everybody's being very polite, thanking you for your talk and uh, your answers. And uh, I think with that, I can let you go, Jan. Thanks a lot for it's your a uh, wonderful contribution. And uh, I'm hoping to see you again soon. Likewise. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Oopala. Sorry, I lost my stream. I'm kind of one man or just trying this meetup, juggling a couple of uh, juggling a couple of tabs and slides, but I think now I got it. Good. It is time to introduce the second speaker of the day, and that is Alex. Alex Simovic is a senior software engineer at Steady and co-author of serverless applications in Node with Node.js. Uh, so that's the book that you can win in our raffle today. Additionally, he writes on medium on both business and technical aspects of serverless. I'm going to bring Alex to stage now. Alex is here in the backstage ready. I see you. Hey, Alex. Hey, hey. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, where do you live? You live in Serbia now, right? Yeah, I live in Belgrade, Serbia. I lived uh, for three and a half years in Paris. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm now I'm now uh, back back here, back in um, the motherland, back on the old. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, it's always good to be surrounded by friends, um, and especially with COVID and everything, you can work remotely from wherever you want. And particularly at Steady, where I work uh, right now, which is a super great company, like there's 17 people. Like there's actually no there's over 70 people from 17 countries. So it's really a- Yeah, nice. You know, how, do you, you have... how do you handle uh, time zones? Um, yeah, I mean, mostly teams are, Yeah, yeah, I know now you're asking specific questions, but yeah, mostly teams are around, uh, are around specific time zones. Yeah. So you, you, you basically can't work with someone from New Zealand, let's say. But you know, people... yes, uh, we uh, we had this episode in Prisma also that my colleague was in New Zealand for uh, for a couple of months. It was incredibly awkward, but uh, we really love him, so uh, we made it work somehow. Uh, shout yeah. out to Josh uh, and Alex. I have just found out that you are also an organizer of Belgrade JS. I yes. have not yeah. known that before. Do you think that you will be able to come back to in-person events in the summer? Um, well, the, the the thing is is that we have postponed all of our events until right. uh, until COVID kind of subsides a bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, JS Belgrade is a community with, with over two thousand people, so it's um, it's quite large. We, uh, yeah, we but beside that we run Serverless Belgrade and we run a Map Meta Belgrade for worldly maps. So we there's two of us, my best friend Slobodan and me. Slobodan, the famous Slobodan. I keep hearing of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll see him in the presentation. Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, anyway, um, I'm not gonna. Let's actually jump into the presentation so people can have uh, time. If you were, if you're interested into kind of looking at those meetups, they're on the meetup.com for everyone who wants to kind of join up, follow up. Um, if you're in, around Belgrade or if you want to give a talk, that's also like super. Uh, super welcome, but I, as I said, like after it gets, you know, kind of easier with the COVID and everything. Absolutely, I will not take any more of our attendees' time with my little chat. <laughs> but if you are ready to uh, share the slides, that would be great. I can add them. Yes. And let's hit it. Um, I, I'm I'm just gonna share my screen. All right. If that's uh, if that's fine. Um, let me see. So I guess you see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Add um, Okay. Well, take it away, Alex. So, yeah, um, 
you're seeing just the, the, little, the little guy, right? Okay. So the usually, so first of all, I know we are going over like 20, 20 minutes. So I, 25 minutes, so I'm not, so this presentation has 84 slides. So this is quite a lot. So I, for some stuff, I'll be a bit fast, so, but feel free to ask questions um, um, and along the way, and I'll answer them later. I'll be some, you know, I'll, I might skip over some topics or not, but, um, but uh you are free to even ask me even after lecture. Anyway, so this little guy, this is actually my friend Slobodan. So I like to start with a story. So Slobodan is a smart guy, like every one of us, you know, here. And uh, Slobodan has an idea. And he would like to create a business. He would like to create a product. Product. He's an engineer like all of us. Um, yeah, this beginning is going to be a bit about around serverless. So he, he has a friend. And his friend is Alex, me. So, of course, I uh, always suggest, as I would even right now, is why don't you build your product with serverless? And he gets upset because either he has heard about serverless, like you guys have heard of, and he's like, I don't want to hear this story again. Or he's a person who's in the Kubernetes and he's like, oh, I don't trust these serverless guys, you know. Um, but anyway... I basically continue with my talks, and um, this is actually also something, something which happens to every one of us when we talk to some people who are considering building something. So we say serverless, you know, skills per use. You have auto failover. You don't pay for idle. You have, um, you know, um, basically no server management and operations around it. And people sometimes get upset about it. Uh, when you when you start mentioning faster delivery and business is more profitable, some sometimes they go even ballistic by saying code needs to run on servers, Amazon will eat you or something very recent, like, you know, you're working for Bezos, you know, Amazon is eating the world and you're joining up on that, you know, I, and sometimes they, they just say like, you're an idiot. Um, but basically, you know, with serverless, that's not the point. And everybody knows this already, like we're at serverless Berlin, so everybody knows. Um, there's, a, there's a nice statement I like to kind of use with server, like a statement from a friend, Goiko, who's also one of serverless heroes. Um, and, and I think both Jan and uh, Aitor know him. Um, so uh, he had a nice comparison saying it's serverless the same way Wi-Fi is wireless. So basically, you know, there are still servers running on. You still have cables like with wireless, but you, you just that ease of access and this infrastructure that you don't no longer have to use to connect your first things or to connect your code or something that you want to do. So some people, when they, when they hear about this, they say, I'll give it a try. And that's my friend Slobodan as well. So, you know, they, st they start to learn about, I mean, how does the ch serverless change? Uh, they start to learn how the, how the whole process of, of software development has slightly changed with serverless and uh, how actually, you know, building a product has actually, you know, um, been impacted by this serverless landscape. But when you build a product, accidents do happen and something will break. And, you know, in this case, what do you do? So basically, you, you know, Slobodan would get upset, like every one of us or your, or your business owners, and the business would basically the business suffers. So the question some people ask is like, so how do I prevent this? And usually, you know, people say you test. So people reply is we don't have time to test. That's a waste of time. Or I don't, I don't, I don't want to get bothered with this kind of stuff. Or there are too many tests. Then you basically just answer like you will have time to fix because, you know, we have to take care of it. So People then say, how do I test a serverless app? And that is the topic of this uh, uh, lecture, which is like designing and testing serverless applications. So who am I? As, uh, as Natalia introduced me, I'm Alexander Simovic. I work at Steady. I'm co-author of serverless applications with Node.js. You can get it in the raffle as well. You can, you know, I'm a serverless hero, as along with Jan, one of the first ones. Um, we are now writing also a second book called Real-Time Graphical Applications with App Sync. Um, we write uh, we write at uh, several pub, and um, if, if if you want to go, you can you know sign up there. You can also find a bit more about the books. We also run these three meet three meetups in Belgrade, and we give a lot of talks. But anyway, the first question I do ask is to, for people is like, why do you test? Because you know the why is sometimes very important. So the usual replies are. You know, and it's an industry standard. Like we, we are expected to test 
we have to have compliance. We have to hit compliance. 90%, sorry, test coverage is a company principle. Some people say that you wouldn't believe it. And, um, you know, we want to ensure that our code works. And, but actually the, what they really mean is some say, honestly, I don't know, our CEO told us, people on Twitter, they say we should. And by, by saying that, they're saying like, you know, my idols are telling me I should do that. I read Hacker News, uh, you know, and so forth. And they're all somewhat, you know, valid responses. But yeah, we all know that the purpose of testing is to find imperfect effects, you know, and, but it's not just about effects. It's not, these things are not good enough. So for example, if we wanted to focus on something just, such as just, just preventing defects, how would we solve, for example, the case of John Null? Um, that, that comes from a book uh, from Goiko, our friend. Um, it's called Humans versus Computers. So he talks about a guy who had, who, whose name is Null is actually a regular Irish name. And imagine that guy who actually tried to uh, get, um, you know, and back in the, I think in the back in the '90s or in the 2000s when Java was in the prime, and he he went to a bank and the the, the person entering his uh, his name said, "I'm sorry, sir, but we cannot enter. You know, our system does not accept your last name." And he was like, "What do you mean?" And he's like, "Basically, your name is null." So some, you know, the, the system at the time <laughs> obviously wasn't um, wasn't wasn't good enough. Nowadays, we uh, you know do do proper um, proper string escape, escape, uh, escapes and so forth. But, you know, that was at the time. Or for example, another case like ELE, also a valid name. Um, the, guy want, the, he, the guy wanted to open a bank account and they told him, I'm sorry, but your name has to have at least three characters. So your first name. So the guy was confused, but I, that's my name, you know? And uh, unfortunately, yeah, this is another focus on defects. Um, and or also, I think her name is Jennifer. Uh, I forgot her last name. So she changed her last name to goback.com. Obviously, a vegan fanatic. Uh, I wouldn't say fanatic, but like a you know a very um, um, uh, you know uh, ecstatic person about you know about trying to kind of um, promote uh, a vegan style of uh, a vegan lifestyle. So she changed her last name to goback.com and. She tried to change her DMV license and they wouldn't let her because the system said, well, I'm sorry, sorry, but the, we cannot have a dot uh, inside of your name. So basically, you know, this general theme that, you know, the testing is about defects is not good enough. So what is it basically enough, uh, about? And everybody knows this. So the main purpose is, you know, reducing risk. So how do we estimate risk and what are the risks in in several supplications and how do they, I mean, what are the risks in general and how do they apply in the age of serverless? Because this paradigm of software development has changed with serverless. We, previously we had big, uh, large monoliths and now we have smaller scale functions. We have like everything split out into tiny little details. And as, as for example, on this case, you, you, you already see like many, many integration points. We, you see many cellular like services. So the, the, everything has decomposed into, into tiniest bits. So with these, in general, I mean, we, there, there are like four types of risks. We have configuration risks, technical workflow risks, business logic risks, and integration risks. Okay, what are those risks? Like how do they, how, how would you split them out? So in an application, for example, like a serverless application, configuration risks would be, have you set up the proper access rights? For, for example, for accessing a certain table, are you allowing your customers uh, sorry, are you allowing your developers or, for example, or, or your or users or anyway, your, for example, your developer roles to have a, so that, for example, your Lambda has access to, has access like um, to, um, let's say, delete the table. If you put a star or if you want to say, hey, I'm going to give to my Lambda everything, um, um, all, all of the possible DynamoDB permissions, you know, does it have the right access rights or have you limited them out or, or have you, or have you shown even more than necessary? For example, are you have you set up properly the events for, from the correct API or from event bridge? Um, are you saying direct buckets? So these are one types of risks when you're, for example, defining your infrastructure uh, in CloudFormation. Then you have technical workflow risks. So handling success on error, error of workflow responses um, on the, and how are we handling you know, incoming events? Jan mentioned like 
handling proper success error res workflow responses. So you could say, for example, in App Sync, that um, having a proper error response uh, or not having the ability to do that would actually present us some some sort of a technical workflow risk. Um, or, for example, with step functions, um, you know, is your step function properly going to the next step? Is there a, a specific case where it, it can fall off? And then we have business logic risks. Um, what is the correct order, for example, to process data? Are you using a FIFO SQSQ, for example, or are you using, you know, like basically these all, all of these things um, uh, come to these business, business logic risks. For example, um, how many of you, uh, I mean, uh, have tried and have have came to a, came to actually a conclusion that that event bridge does not guarantee correct data orders always on I mean uh, on your on on the on the events received. There have been cases that on some apps that, for example, that we've uh, that we've encountered that you would sometimes get a duplicate event through the event bridge. So it does not get, guarantee like SQS a single event coming in a, in a for example for example single uh, unique um, event coming to to uh, to your lambda for example. Um, and some other things like really, you know, what's the right event structure, is this file conversion correct, and so forth. And the last but not least are the integration risks. So, you know, um, have you properly set up, you know, these graphical objects in DynamoDB um, and so forth? I'm not going to go into the details, for example, how are we querying, are we properly querying the S3 object? How are we storing them? Are we reading them from API gateway and so forth? So how do we address those risks? And you know, at I mean, or at least some of them. Like, and you know, usually people would say, "Well, um, you know, we write better code." And you know, people on the Twitter say literally the same thing. They say, "You know, better code architecture." Um, then you would find some others who would say, "Well, your code is the is the liability, so you should go as little as code as possible." And now we are recently seeing a new thing saying, "Reduce your lambdas and go lambdaless." Um, so. How do we improve the design and architecture of these functions? And at the same time, um, what do we do when we have this kind of quantity? Like this is an all older type of application. Like uh, I think it's uh, from Cloudformer if you're using the AWS service, where you it will actually show all the connections with all your lambdas and all the roles and everything. And you know, what do you do in this case? So, have you heard and what about hexagonal architecture? And I'm sure that. Some of you have heard about it. Now it's becoming more and more, and there have been talks. Um, even my friend Slobodan and I, we have given a talk at, at AWS reInvent 2018 on using hexagonal architecture uh, to build better uh, serverless applications, even back then. So that's like, you know, four years ago. Uh, almost, yeah, almost four years ago. But in general, yeah, hexagonal architecture, if you haven't heard about it, is this, you can actually read through this whole paragraph, but basically what it means to simplify it, because it can be, you know, super boring, um, is that you want your um, applications to be uh, uh, to design in such a way that they can be easily tested without these tight integrations between um, specific services, but particularly in 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 the in the area of serverless. So, what does that look like in reality? So, take a look at this piece of code. Um, so. I mean, it's a simplified, um, um, you know, Stripe uh, Lambda that ha that handles Stripe charges, um, and what it does is you can see it's it's like doing some process responses, and then it's basically returning if there is you know if the body is kind of invalid there's no I mean sorry if the, there isn't anything in the body and then like just parsing every, everything and just you know in, like everything in the single in in, in a single file it's uh, you know calling the Stripe library and you know, uh, creating a charge. But what, what what's the problem with this? Like many of us would say, well, you know, this kind of piece of code should work, right? Well, the problem is that everything's tightly coupled and everything's, everything's locked and connected. So why is that a problem, you might ask? Well, the problem is if, if either, or either of these services fail, you will, you will have a hard time figuring out which services failed. For, so for example, if you receive a page or duty alert, if you're you know, using those or something, you would automatically see an alarm and say, wait, wait, something's going on, what, something's wrong, and you won't be as sure which piece of the code kind of uh, failed. Was it uh, the API gateway maybe service failure? Maybe there was an outage on lambdas? Maybe 
there was something wrong in your code, maybe someone deployed, like there's a variety of possible cases here. And since since several supplications are, as, as we saw previous, like they have many, like we have many integration points because it's built of many building blocks. It's, it kind of ends up like this. You kind of end up with, you know, you're trying to connect your Lambda to each and any one of those outlets, like you would do like in Britain, you have a different a, a different thing you're trying to connect to, you know, you have these adapters, which are which you're trying to connect to um, to a uh, US system or uh, Italian or or Japanese or, or the Central European or whatever. So you, you have, you know, many of these integration points and what you basically need are adapters. And you, you know, basically what you, what you need, I mean, how we solved it in, in real life is by building these adapters and we, we, we separated out our code and we basically using these adapters, we know that, you know, if our charger works and if the, if we know there's power in the outlet, well, then the problem must be in the, in the adapter and so forth. So what's the, basically the main focus of hexagonal architecture is like that we test, first of all, that we test the integration at Pion you know, as, as you can see here, and we build these kind of small adapters, which help us um, uh, split out these, these connection integration points with, uh, between our, um, uh, in, like, for example, services that we use, as you can see, you know, here, for example, in this case, we would split out our business logic, our core business logic. So um, in that case of, um, of uh, a Stripe Lambda, you would have a specific uh, business logic, which is in the core, and then you would actually split out the pieces which are connected to these points, like receiving the event, it, like you would have a, spe a, a special adapter for, for parsing API gateway events. We have a special adapter for DynamoDB, for example, in this case, or Stripe. And then, for example, other like SNS, if, you're, if, you're, if your Lambda is call, uh, uh, talking to different services and so forth. Basically, what do you achieve with this? Like, this, this is com more complex, right? Um, well, you are actually separating these two risks one from another. So you're separating their business risk and you're, you can now sp specifically test your business logic code from the integration risk, which is, which is basically testing out the, um, uh, how do the events come? And for example, are, are we like, what if API Gateway changes their you know, event, event format? They won't, of course, but what if they do? Or what if, we, if, what if there's a malformed event, you know? Or something like that, or in or or in next case, uh, what if our business code works and you know um, we, we basically want to call it Stripe, but you know you want to verify it independently from Stripe. What if, for example, Stripe is failing? You wanna you wanna independently verify that you know Stripe is working, and you wanna verify that your that your business logic is working. So you would basically just run the test, and you would automatically discover that your business logic is working fine, and you would actually see that. The stripe at the moment is failing, and you know exactly why. Why? Uh, what happened? And because you would, because by having the separate adapter, you know that you know this adapter is the problematic piece. Okay, in code, how does it look like? Well, here is one piece. So this is the core, the core uh, business logic. You would export your um, your core business logic that you would, for example, see here, this service business logic. You would export it to one file and, you know, it, it could be called like in this case, it would be just a function like called charge customer. It would, it would accept all of the possible values that, you can, it, that it can have. And it would just in the core basically just say call the, you know, this abstracted away adapter called payment processor, which would do the create charge. And then in the end, you could say, well, you know, publish this event to SNS, uh, publish this event to PubSub. Now, you might notice that the Stripe is no longer here. The, also, the SNS notifications, uh, it, we don't mention SNS anywhere. The reason for that is because you want to abstract away these adapters to, to have a neutral name. Why do you have a neutral name? Because you want them to say, um, uh, uh, you want to describe with, with this operation um, uh, that they're doing, like for example, in this case, payment, payment processing, because what if you want to change the payment, payment processor? You want to use PayPal or you want to use Braintree. Um, um, you know, it doesn't matter that it should be, I, it, it doesn't make any any me meaningful sense to call it Stripe or Braintree or whatever. It make, makes sense to call it payment, payment, payment processor. And then within it, within the actual implementation, you, like, th this is why this is, this is also called ports and adapters. In this case, you would, um, um, uh, you know, describe all the details of, of this payment processing within the payment processor. And, you know, you're, you're basically just separating out the details, nothing, nothing special. Uh, and for example, 
in the code for uh, the, the pub sub, pub sub, you would have this where, um, you know, in, in this case, you know, the, the pub sub is, is the SNS, you just publish. And for example, if you wanted to say, well, I want to publish to event bridge, for example, or you want to, I want to emit an event. Uh, you no longer have to change your main business logic code. You only change it here. And all of a sudden, all of your code works. Your tests are, uh, haven't changed for the business logic. They have only changed for the adapter. And that's about it. And by the way, there's another cool feature about this is if you pass in these optional parameters, which have default values, for example, in this case, it's pub sub, now it's SNS, as you can see here on the screen. What happens is that, um, is that you can easily test without um, having to introduce AWS mocks, uh, ex external libraries. You can basically um, uh, create your own objects, your own simple objects, or like just spy functions, nothing, nothing, nothing in particular. You don't need to import the whole AWS SDK and that kind of stuff for, in, for your tests. You basically just pass in empty objects, simple objects, and you're able to quickly test out whether um, uh, not, not empty objects, like just spy objects, and, and you, you can easily test out and see, oh, oh yeah, now this has been called. Yeah, I don't need to do specific mocking. I don't need to do specific setup and so forth. So you know, all of this, um, has, uh, all of these features come with this hexagonal architecture approach. So after explaining a bit of this, some people would like to, I mean, usually ask me like, what do I test in a serverless app? So how does that now how i mean how does that look like and so the thing is i always ask a counter question which is like how do, what do you test an additional app so there is this testing pyramid that everybody knows um tests are con you know we can separate them in kind of four categories you can see you know and in a traditional app the most of the tests that we do are in unit tests um very few integration tests where we are testing the integration points very little because of, of automated UI tests because they're very expensive, you know, and they're very slow. To actually run a UI test, you, you know, um, um, in, in many cases, you would uh, either, I mean, previously, uh, not now with Cypress, for example, um, you would have to, you know, kind of spin up your, your specific architecture. Uh, you, you would have to, uh, <clears throat> for example, you, I mean, this infra infrastructure would cost a lot more <clears throat> and so forth. And of course, like the biggest chunk of cost is usually the manual session-based testing. I mean, we are all, everybody's trying to avoid those. But anyway, how does this test, how does this differ from testing a serverless app? And um, so um, what has changed with it is, is this managing managed infrastructure, many small business logic pieces and many integration points. And how does that affect? So let's say that that um, uh, pyramid is, first of all, I mean, let, let's take a look here. Um, it uh, changes it because now it looks like this. The cost of infra infrastructure, due to, infrastructure due to serverless has actually re reduced significantly, where now we are able to easily create a lot more UI tests because they, the, um, you can spin up as much as possible in infrastructure as you want, um, as you need. Um, you can actually do a lot more integration tests and you can do, um, you know, and of course, the automated unit tests are basically the same. But just because of this re reduction of, of, um, of the cost of infrastructure, you're coming to this uh, kind of UI, um, um, uh, in an increase of the UI tests. But anyway, many people then say, okay, you show me why some of this, these risks, a bit of hexagonal, but how can you tell me how and can you give me some more information um, on that? So that's the, that's the, the next piece. So I'm going to cover a few quick things. So um, let's talk about, so I'm going to mention tools, integration test structure, an example, for example, how does it look like? What, what, do, what, uh, what can we do with testing environments, UI testing and testing, for example, app sync apps. So I, I, I can actually, I mean, maybe expand a bit more on what Jan was, was talking about. Um, so first the tools nowadays, I mean, a few years ago, I would say, you know, focus on, you know, maybe Jasmine and Mocha. Some people are trying to use Jess and so forth. Nowadays, things are very simple. Um, focus on using Jess. That's the, the most dominant kind of tool because now you can use uh, both them for front end and, uh, and back end tests. Like that's the dominant one. And uh, I can share that at Steady, we use Jest like almost exclusively. Cypress as well for your end to end tests, which you want to, uh, when you want to build them for, um, 
for your serverless apps, front-end applications, and so forth. Another thing which I really recommend, but it's a commercial thing, is uh, Wallaby.js. So what Wallaby.js does, it, when you're writing your unit tests, it enables, it actually uh, runs those tests in the background for you. And it inside your, for example, your VS Code, it actually, it's a, like a plugin which um, allows you to see the results and actually even mark by your, um, it actually even marks by this on the side of your um, VS code, it marks which path, or like for example, if a test is failing, it marks in which path of your code does it fail, reducing the, the, the debugging and the, um, the testing time that you, I mean, and the time that you uh, spend writing a test. So really, really, really high recommendation for Wallaby JS. I'm using it all the time because, you know, when you're writing your, your test for a uh, unit test or integration test for Lambda, you know, for your Lambda functions, um, basically you end up looking at like, okay, which pathway, uh, wh when did this test break? Why did it break? Uh, uh, like, I mean, you're, you're trying to figure out um, what's the value of specific things. What Wallaby does, it actually invokes even those logs and shows you in while you're while you're de defining them, it actually runs them and shows you on, on the side of your on, of your code, uh, like through some kind of like hidden comments. It, it shows you what is the evaluation of this, like for example, log or debug of, of of what you're doing without you having to run them. It basically does them for you, and of course the standard tools like Jest and Mocha if you're into those. Um, okay, unit integration tests. How do they? I mean, I've shown you. Uh, uh, how would you design, for example, hexagonal architecture, a uh, simple kind of from a Stripe endpoint, Stripe, uh, creating a Stripe charge endpoint, but um, how would that look like in like in the structure? So, for example, um, this is uh, so. Let's take a look. Uh, let's uh, let's look at it from the example of the Stripe charge. So, for example, in this, I mean, this is just a fictive name, main.js, so disregard it. Um, if you're using TypeScript, of course, I mean, you can call it my main TS, of course. Um, so you would have this Lambda.js file. You, it doesn't matter. If it, it can be called something else. And this main.js file would contain would contain the business logic for your uh, hexagonal architecture, uh, hexagonally architected uh, Lambda code, code. And there you would have the specific unit tests for this, this, this business logic and these integration tests well, for whether your actually your main business logic is now calling in this case a file repository, which is like you could call it an S3 adapter, is it calling it properly? Is it receiving events properly? And does the actual code work? Um, if those pass, you are you can you know you're basically they're de risking your whole business logic base. Okay. Next, ne the next side is the file repository, where you would have a, spe a, sp a specific file repository file, like file repository.ts or js, whatever, or if you're or into Python or something, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter. And you would have specific unit tests and integration tests belonging to these um, to this file repository. In in case you're, for example, saying I don't want to use S3. I mean, I don't know if you why would wouldn't you? But you know, if you do, if you didn't didn't want to use it, um, you would basically um, um, you know, just kind of have, you, you would have to create these tests for it. And, um, you know, they belong w w along with this file. And they, they, all, they are only like testing whether, uh, what happens with the file repository when it gets called, what happens, um, does, uh, do, uh, for example, if you're doing some, some kind of file manipulation in your file, file repository, um, you could test that, that piece of logic as well. And then you could test out by, if you remember what I said about this kind of um, uh, just, using hexagonal hexagonal and sending these default parameters like optional but default parameters you would actually say um well pub sub in that case or in this case like you know a file repository a file service would be s3 and you could just say you can pass in a pass in an object and you would test whether um your whether when you send uh or invoke this file repository or you, you say create a file or save a file whether it actually calls this uh, this actual S3 uh, simple jest function that you're calling. So I mean, this, these are the kind of things that, that you're basically testing. So I'm just gonna give like one example um, of of this kind of you know kind of unit test. So um, uh, this is from our a library which we developed a long time ago called Desolé IO. Um, it's a library like um, like uh, like for Sentry or something like that. We, it was it's a bit, it's an open source century alternative, but uh, it, we don't maintain it anymore. But anyway, the test there would basically uh, show you that um, 
So for example, in this case, we are doing this uh, port uh, or basically this adapter when an event comes from the API, whether the, what, uh, you know, what are the possible error types and uh, what happens if, you know, if um, for, for these specific messages when they come, if, they're, if, if, the, if the exception is being sent because it's mostly for handling these errors, um, if it's fine or not. And I don't want to kind of go into the details, but in general, um, uh, we are testing this, this, um, this, this, this conversion, this port, whether it actually properly, properly uh, analyzes, pro properly uh, translates this test, uh, this, not, not this test, sorry, properly translate this data that comes from Sentry or some other service into our, uh, into our format. And so that what, what that means is that, we have, that with, with these tests, we are ensuring whether a proper event is coming into our business logic. And if we were to run this test, at, and I mean, let, so let, let's say hypothetically that our function is failing and you want to run this test um, to, to figure out what happens. If the failure was in from the Sentry side and it changed the event, uh, you would automatically say, oh, you know, the adapter is failing and the business logic is, uh, is working fine. The, you know, for example, saving to, the, to a specific S3 bucket is working fine. And now you, you, you can easily figure out that the problematic piece is coming from um, from Sentry. Okay, um, testing environments. Um, I'm not going to go into this. This is very like very simple. We, everybody knows that now you can have multiple testing environments with with AWS with serverless in general. You can create as many as many as you want. You no longer have to prepay them. So, for example, um, you know we uh, most of the companies nowadays you have like multiple uh, generally available environments and you know uh, and, and then you SSO per each product per, per each of those products or and not just or but and you if for each developer you should have their own testing environment like you create your own testing accounts there is a tool that helps you with that it's called org formation uh, developed by one of my colleagues at steady uh, Olaf Connie and um, I really suggest looking at that because this kind of sets up the whole SSO, all the accounts, everything that you might want to, might you might have wanted to do with the AWS Control Tower, you could actually do it with them. It's like like a landing zone control tower, SSO, everything combined into one. So you know, if you want to create a bunch of those testing environments, you set up SSO and everything. I really suggest that tool. There's another thing that happens is like people say, well, testing makes you slower. Well, you know, I can argue that. With testing delivery is quicker, um, but this is a point of argue, uh, point, point of you know argue when does this delivery is when is this delivery quicker? Uh, at the beginning, usually people um, complain and say, well, at the beginning we want to quickly develop, but anyway, yeah, um, this speed is actually paid for in the after, like in maybe if, if you're building if you're real if you already have built a prototype and you're already realizing that you're going to build you know that, that there's traction for your product and you're going to build a full scale enterprise kind of product maybe or something like that. Um, or, or SaaS, SaaS startup, then, you know, that's when testing starts to pay off. UI testing. So UI testing with serverless, it's also kind of quite, quite simple uh, if, if you kind of think about it. Like, so because of the cheap infrastructure and this easy and fast parallelization, we come to a point where, um, you know, you can start UI, your, your start your UI test, for example, headless Chrome, you can actually run into Lambda layers. And at the same time, you can, do, you can run countless um, UI tests. Um, there are many articles on this, so I'm not gonna, you know, kind of. If, if you really wanted to kind of share some of them uh, with you later, like feel free to ping me and uh, and I'll and I'll uh, share them with you. But you can easily now build uh, specific lambdas, lambda layers, and other, uh, you know, um, I mean, run headless Chrome and run those UI tests uh, in parallel, which kind of speeds up the whole process in sig significantly. I mean, um, but. At the same time, I'm also suggesting to use uh, Cypress. So yeah, and now comes the interesting piece where I can easily just kind of connect to uh, what Jan was was uh, was talking about. Like, how do you do testing apps and applications? We have even talked. I think these are some pieces from the book we're writing of, on uh, real-time GraphQL um, applications with App Sync. Um, um, so basically. Usually what we test in serverless apps, you know, as like, it's very simple as it's the same testing pyramid. Um, you know, this is how we kind of, uh, I already explained, like with end to end tests, we, we test the kind of the whole UI and the services and everything with the integration tests. We test the integration point between functions. Uh, I mean, not, not between functions, but, but with functions and these um, 
specific pieces uh, like S3, <clears throat> like an S3, SNS, and so forth. And then we, we do a lot of unit tests where we kind of test actual business logic. And so forth. I mean, I already explained it. But what happens in, with AppSync? Well, with, with, with AppSync, we, there is no purpose in doing integration tests. Uh, the reason why is because AWS handles that for you. Um, AWS does, the, does these pieces uh, of like, how does your resolver call the NODB? You know, like you, there's no need for you to test, oh, is it going to work or not? Or what if it fails? So that's, that's, on, on, that's on the actual AWS side. But what does actually that give you? It gives you, an, it, so it actually forces you to write many more end-to-end -end tests because that's the main focus as even Jan mentioned, like he would actually write a lot more end-to-end -end tests. And the next thing that it also is important is like these unit tests. And how do we write these unit tests? Well, also Jan has mentioned that, I can continue on that, which is like this Amplify AppSync simulator. Um, um, so why, we, why do we go with the Amplify AppSync simulator and VTL is a, a Java, uh, is a Java basically uh, uh, tool, library? Um, um, well, the reason for that is you don't want to run Java in, and you, want, you, don't want to run, you don't want to write Java code to actually test your AppSync application. It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So the Amplify, app sync, uh, Ampl Amplify team has built this AppSync simulator, which um, enables you so you, you, to write these tests in like in TypeScript, and you can easily um, uh, you you just do the setup of the of the of the simulator, and then you write. I'm going to show you an example. But in general, how is this process of testing working for uh, AppSync uh, uh, applications? Well. You know, you want to render this template. Well, you know, these are the steps that you want to verify, like whether, you know, what happens with the array, with the errors, what happens with the content of the stash. Uh, you want to verify the result value, and you know, these are the things that you want to kind of ensure um, inside your AppSync um, VTL uh, VTL template. Um, you want so basically, what you want to do is um, you can test out, um, uh, you know. What's what's happening on the stash when when, when things come? Uh, how does this get processed in a way? And I mean, basically, what is the uh, the end result? And how does this kind of testing re response uh, kind of look like? Um, uh, well, here is a kind of an example test that that's, that's part from from the book uh, that we are uh, writing at the uh, as of the moment. Um, so you can see on, on the screen, like you basically set up and instantiate this with your simulator. You need to set it up as well. And then you uh, basically just kind of you know pass in some pass in context values. You see whether uh, there are some any errors. Uh, for example, in, in this case, like if there is an error that some survey was not found, and um, or and that you want to verify there is no that there is no result. And in, in, like this is this is a basically a very simple response mapping template like um, a unit test. So I mean um, uh, we will. We will um, release some of the chapters soon, so you might be, you might actually. Um, uh, I think the testing will be uh, a piece of, of the first uh, uh, of the release, so you you can you can take a look at it and so forth. Anyway, so this actually does make sense because you want because you know the VTL testing is actually super tedious. Every time you want to do a test, you want to verify how it works. You have to deploy it and so forth and so forth. So with this Amplify Local Simulator and with this kind of unit test. You can basically test out whether your VTL is going to work fine or not, and basically these are just unit tests. So yeah, just focus on do not write integration tests. I mean, there's no point of doing those. Um, and we came to an end to the summary. So as we already said, the goal of testing to reduce risks. Um, advice is to use hexagonal architecture to design testable apps, um, testable Lambda functions. So not apps. <laughs> um, Serverless, you know, kind of helps you going being faster and cheaper. Um, and for AppSync similar for testing AppSync, you know, basically this is this is the way to go. You don't want to run to set your to, to set up Java locally. You don't want to go with, um, uh, you know, um, doing things these things manually. You don't want to deploy them like that. Like VTL is very brittle and it tends to easily break. So you know, write your unit tests for 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 these templates, they, you can even automate them. By the way, there's um, there are some discussions that there might, like on the repository for, I think Amplify, if I, if I remember correctly, that they have, they have been discussing openly, so you can take a look and find it out, figure it out. May, maybe in the future, they will enable JavaScript for this point. We don't know yet, but there have been talks on the repository. So, you know, of course, JavaScript is easier to write than VTL, right? 
Um, so yeah, that's about it. And at the end, you know, this is kind of, you know, the general um, people are happy and like, you know, shaking on the deal. Anyway, if you want to, you know, follow up on more, you can follow me on Twitter. We both Slobodan, Goiko and me, we are writing on several pub. There's a vast amount of information there um, on like even how do you, you know, use CloudFormation to deploy front end stuff or and uh, app sync tests. And there's a bunch of things going on. These are the books that we are um, uh, currently like in the service application with Node.js is in the raffle. You can maybe be the lucky winner. And um, if you're interested more about these like real time graph applications, if you want to have a book uh, for the course, of course, I would suggest like going to Jan's course. Um, but for the book, if you want to have a book, and read about it and so forth, you you know, we highly suggest uh, to, um, you know, kind of, you can subscribe on the newsletter and, you know, re receive maybe the first information when it's going to go out or the first, you know, pieces that are going to be released. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Oh, wait. Alex, that's Alex. Okay, got it. Uh, thanks a lot for that. I really enjoyed these uh, little figurines that you had uh, in the presentation with like little pudgy uh, Slobodan hanging out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have this kind of common, um, you know, visual, visual, visualization kind of approach where we like to use these simple characters to explain some topics which, you know, are not that complex. Um, we tend to make them complex. Of course, AWS documentation doesn't help. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're, you know, by explaining with these small kind of pieces, it's easier for everyone to understand and to kind of, we also identify with those characters. These are the questions in which we asked on this path. We are not smarter than anyone, you know, like we're all equal here. So, you know, it's just kind of, you know, using, using the visualizations to ease up the path for everyone to kind of, you know, to everyone be up to the, you know, up, up to everyone be equal. I, that's kind of, I, I, that's, that's actually what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah, no, I got you. Uh, would you like to take some questions? And see yeah, what... um, I, I, of course. I mean, the only thing is I, I know I took a bit more time, so um, I'm not going to, I mean, I can just kind of uh, answer. I think that, I think there aren't many questions, right? Or Yeah. Um, so there's, I can read them if you want. <laughs> uh, well, I have a great tool here for uh, okay. putting them up on the screen. Would you like to start with John's question? Yes, yes. Um, uh, so, um, testing against an emulator such as local stack is a proper integration test. Um, I honestly, I haven't used local stack uh, in this case, um, so I can't really give a proper answer. Um, but I can, uh, as far, uh, I mean, if you want, you can, you can, you know, kind of explain, explain a bit, bit more and I'll be more than happy to kind of, to kind of, um, say about it, but I think I, I kind of heard about it. So I, you know, I can just assume that it wouldn't be a proper response. So if you want, you can give more explanation. I can, you know, kind of tell you. That's a uh, great response for when you have no response. I, I think you handled it uh, amazingly. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> But I haven't used local stuff. Yeah. Moving on, Paul is saying, unfortunately, just support for ES modules is still experimental. But uh, he'd like to start using ES modules on a greenfield project. What's your Alex experience using ES modules? Um, yes, I fully agree with John. Um, there are uh, Paul. Sorry, John. Sorry, Paul. Um, I also messed up your name before, and I still feel bad about it. I think there's some kind of uh, phantom uh, going on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so um, at the moment, we aren't using ES modules with Jest. Um, the, um, what has, what has like, what has actually helped us? I mean, we, we have avoided this, I mean, on an enterprise scale, um, on, an enter on an enterprise scale, um, we aren't using, I mean, we are basically just using TypeScript regular. So I think... You know, it's, I don't know, um, we didn't have that much issues. I, I don't know, maybe you can be more specific. Um, what seems to be your, the, the case that you're trying to solve and um, and what was the, actually the main, the, main, the main problem there? I, I mean, we, we aren't using them um, in, our, in, in our production stacks, so I can't um, help with that. But uh, we didn't, what I actually tried it on some um, pieces, uh, on some local kind of uh, 
how I don't know how I would say like um, on some of my local kind of projects, and I didn't kind of encounter that much issues. I don't know what can be. I mean, maybe you can be more specific, and I can help you a bit more. Um, uh, yeah, another thing that Paul has to say is that he appreciates your little Slobodan cartoons as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They Thank are you, Paul. Wonderful. They are lovely. Um, that has some kind words to say to you. Great presentation. It helps me a lot. Yeah. We are considering moving to serverless. Lucian says great stuff. So uh, uh, a lot of uh, very, very positive feedback here from our audience. Um, now I think I remembered for local stack. I think you oh. can... Uh, I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to kind of like the question was on my mind all the time. Yeah, I think you can, I think you can basically say that uh, using it again, such as local stack can be a proper integration test uh, because you are, um, you know, you're basically uh, verifying whether this integration point between your Lambda function and uh, it, uh, it, uh, and it works anyway, uh, I think you can say it. Um, but anyway, Paul and um, Paul and John, uh, if you can kind of, if you want to ask more questions, feel free to kind of ping me on Twitter. My DMs are open, and we can talk more about it or something like that. I, um, I, I am more than happy to kind of assist in any any possible way. So, yeah. Word. Okay, Alex. Thank you very much uh, for being here. It was a super pleasure. Uh, hoping to work with you again soon. Yeah. Likewise. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Let me get my slides up again. Very well. That was Alex. Uh, I still have a couple of announcements to make. I will make it quick because uh, we are a little bit behind schedule, but that's what happens. Uh, I would like to invite you to join us for a very special edition of the Prisma Meetup next week. Uh, we will talk about all things Remix. So Remix, as the full stack web framework, has taken the tech world by the storm. Uh, we're going to take a deep dive into its features and see how it fits into the Prisma ecosystem, too. That is uh, next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, Central European time. And during this meetup, you will be able to win some tickets to Node Congress. We have prepared five uh, full tickets to Node Congress to be won. And that brings me to the topic of Node Congress that will take place uh, on February 17 and 18. And it is a two-day conference on all things Node.js, Edge native workers, uh, Cloudflare, uh, Cloudflare and others, serverless, Dino, and other JavaScript backend runtimes, gathering backend and full stack engineers across the globe in the cloud. Uh, the ticket that we have to give away uh, gives you access to talks and activities on both days uh, and uh, many other perks, really. And that being said, I would like to remind you that our raffle is still ongoing, uh, but I will be putting the names in the randomizer tool as uh, Aether speaks. So the window where you can join the raffle is closing. So, so make sure to, to get there and time to introduce our last speaker uh, of the meetup now. Ater Lessa is a principal solutions architect in the AWS developer acceleration team covering EMEA. He has spent the last 14 years in various roles focusing on IT infrastructure, cloud operations, business development, developer tooling, and modern application development. Super impressive. Let's welcome Ater to the stage as soon as I figure out how to do it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there he is, he appears. <laughs> it's really, it's really Hello. challenging doing it alone, you know. Like I keep, I keep thinking I'm messing something up. Too many screens, too much going on. I'm happy to have you here, Hazar. My pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for the invitation. In fact, yeah. it's hard to go right after Jan and Alex. They're such a good friends, and then oh, so I'm actually right after. I have to, uh, <laughs> I have to raise the bar some. Uh, you fit <clears throat> right in. So Ater is joining us from his new house close to the Hague. So this is why you're seeing this new new house uh, deco. <laughs> Indeed. <awkward> at first. <laughs> Indeed. Um, I, I the question that John had on the local stack. If we have if we have like I think I can finish early. Uh, if if I can finish early, I'm happy to answer that local stack. If John steals around, yeah, on the integration uh, test. Great idea. Everything is uh, everything is coming together. Uh, all right, uh, I can see your screen in here already. Okay. 
prepared. Okay, take it away, Aitor. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Aitor Lessa. I'm a principal solutions architect uh, at AWS. I've been here for nearly nine years now. We've been in serverless since 2016-ish. Uh, and this talk is all about something called Lambda Power Tools. There's not going to be any slides. I'm going to be as quick as I can because I'm also conscious of your time. And this talk begins by talking about well architected. In 2017, we launched something called Serverless Lens, which essentially was a collection of all the common practices we've seen working with customers that were battle tested with multiple customers across the globe. So those practices uh, were written initially uh, by me and three other friends. And then that kept being up to date every year until last year. In 2020, we launched this into the console. It was great to have as a white paper, but the challenge was how do I benchmark my application, my service application against these practices? I would like to have a review. I would like to have a report, for instance, of all my workloads. What am I missing? What should I be doing instead? What are some very specific practices depending on the questions we are asking. The paper was more detailed, trying to get into, I assume you know nothing about serverless and I'm gonna guide you through what are possible architectures can be done in serverless back in 2017 until 2020. And what are some of the architectures that there's no way you have to use a mix of serverless and non-serverless uh, services uh, or traditional in that case. So in, in 2020 and then 2021, we launched this into the console, which looks more or less like this. If you were to go to the console, you would see a well architected as a service or a tool. And by creating a new application there or workload, you would be able to access these questions and each of those best practices. There's plenty in there. And this being, has been used already by over 10,000 customers. And this is how customers have an idea of what are the practices and we're trying to not get into, you're using Java, this is a different one. You are using Node.js, this is a different one. We try to go on a more abstract level and that should touch most of the serverless applications we know as of today. This has been great, but not yet fantastic. What was missing in this space was we noticed that most customers were trying to do this, uh, these checks or these reviews. And one of the pieces that were missing was I'm trying to apply a CI, CD automation testing that you're, you're, you're describing to me, but I'm trying to add uh, distributed tracing. We are not interested in only enabling distributed tracing, but how you add instrument or code are uh, using centralized uh, logging and structured logging. So you can make use of uh, analytics tools to know exactly where the problem is. So these were very specific to application runtime and not so much about the infrastructure bits. And because it's application, every language does it slightly different. Some applications will require certain frameworks, other applications would have to do it by hand. So this variance and this disconnection led us to create what we call Lambda Power Tools. The Lambda Power Tools is available in Python today and Java, and we just launched TypeScript in beta. And soon, 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 I guess this year, we will have .NET as well. The idea behind Lambda Power Tools is taking those practices in the serverless lens and make it easier for you to adopt them without breaking a sweat. We started with the observability pieces, the operational pieces like tracer, metrics, and logger. And then we kept going and adding more and more and more as the community were helping. There are tons of people helping build this thing. You know, it's just not just us. And the idea is that we you can add each of those utilities as you need them, as opposed to you have to use all of them at once. So if I were to take this for a spin, because of the time and because I don't know how much my internet, the new internet is gonna hold, I've already deployed a simple application. I basically just did SAM init using SAM CLI to deploy an application, a hello world. And I'm gonna be modifying this hello world to show you how uh, this base, one of the, the core features of Lambda Power Tools look like. So let me know if I need to zoom in more. I did one more zoom, but if you're not seeing, just let me know afterwards. What this application is doing is from the basic hello world template is we have a slash hello and we have a slash hello slash uh, any particular dynamic name. 
So think like, hello, Lassa, hello, Ator, you name it. This application per se, it's very simple. We're just printing the event as it comes and we're just returning hello world. We're not yet dealing with different routes. If we were to deal with the different routes today without Lambda Power Tools, we would have to start doing things like this is our resource and this has to be hello and do something. And for instance, and, uh, and event HTTP method, let's say, get and this can kind of become tricky and it's easy to, to get into a situation where you're you're missing uh, certain parameters you're probably doing some error prone uh, error handling and things like this how does that look like in lambda power tools if i were to simply send a request right now i should see a hello world as it's supposed to have in the background to make it quicker i have my logs being shown so you can see i'm printing that that log as it comes. So I can see slash hello, and it was a get exactly as it's supposed to be. In the background, I also have some sync. So as soon as I make a change into the file, it should automatically deploy uh, very fast. So we can kind of see this iteratively. How does it look like? So first thing, I'm going to try to import uh, Lambda Power Tools. So I'm going to do these three things first. I'm going to import logger, tracer, and metrics. So if I were to do tracer, logger, metrics, and let's see, upper case. If we do like this, then we already started well. This is exactly what I needed to do the very basics first. So if I wanted to do something like, I want to start with structure logging. Just by initializing the logger, I would have a log in JSON already. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, I want to inject the Lambda context into the log. So next time I log, you should automatically see a structure log in JSON now. But because we're using API Gateway, I want to get the API request ID into my log so I can have a correlation ID as well. So what I would do is I would import again on the logging side and we have a correlation path. So in this case, we can just say, correlation ID path and we auto complete with we're using API gateway rest but it could be ALB app sync or in fact it could actually be anything that's a JSON uh, James path anything that's a JSON expression so I could say that my request is coming from a header called X request ID for instance so I could do that too but for now let's focus on the basics and then we can kind of customize as we please so this alone will automatically gives us information. Like if I try to do logger.info.event, for instance, now, let's see how that looks like. Uh, I think it's already, yeah, it's already synced. So if I try to do a hello again, I should now see in my logs, let me just, so you can easily see it. I trust the internet, it will work. You should. So look at the difference now. I'm going to copy and paste this so it's easier for you to see it. It's a lot more information now just by initializing our logs and we can easily trace now that information anywhere. Could be CloudWatch logs, could be Logly, could be Datadog, could be anything. Notice that we now have additional information. We have the name of our service, which is in our environment variables. We have whether that's a code start or not. We have detailed information about this function whether the function name, memory, ARM, and stuff like that. We also have the correlation ID, which I just promised to you. It's coming from API Gateway, and we inject that there. We also have the X-ray trace ID, which allows us to have the same ID everywhere too, and it helps us to use all the AWS services uh, in terms of integration. And that log event is exactly the same under message now. And we have location, where exactly that came from. This is just a logger. There's a lot more information we can do. Sampling, sampling, simply logs, like dynamically adjust to debug on the percentage of the requests that are coming in. And there's a lot more to it. But for now, let's just stick to the basics. The next one we can do is we can use, I'm going to use a separate one. We can use metrics. So metrics are essentially using 
actually not clear logs, log metrics. Let me go over here. What I can do in my in my logs, for instance, I could say metrics dot add metric, and I can say the name. It's gonna be a hello event, for instance, or a successful hello event. And then we can say the unit. That's a challenge. How would you know what CloudWatch metrics support? They could be count. It could be count like this. You never know. So in this case, and in many other cases in Power Tools, we know all these common struggles and we already provide you with an answer to it as much as we can. So if I were to go to metrics, import metric unit, I can now know exactly what Cloud, CloudWatch supports and I can just do as I please. I could say value equals to one. And then the next invocation, I should be able to see this metric in CloudWatch async with no performance impact. For now, let's just not do this. And I'm just going to keep, I just want the CloudWatch metric that if it is a cold start, I want to be in there. So that we already handled it. The next one I want to do is I want to trace this execution. So I want to make sure that this execution, once it runs, I should be able to see a next ray. So let's wait for this to sync. It's just building the code now, done. So if I try again, I'll try a few times just in case. And if I go to X-Ray, actually I already had it opened. It doesn't matter. And that's gonna take a while. Let's say one minute. I see a few requests that I that I did. If I were to click in any, let's say this one here, I should see that information already without changing too much in my code. I see that it was a request coming from API Gateway, went from a Lambda function. And I have some, let me just try to zoom in for you, zoom out actually. I have something called the invocation and I have some common conventions so you know exactly what part of the code was traced. So I can see that the name of my function is called Lambda Handler, that my entry point, because I have this hash hash. And if I click in here, I look at metadata, I have the response automatically captured. If it was an exception, I should also be able to get that. And I also have additional annotations which act as a key value to allow you to filter those traces, those requests, so I can have code start and service, for instance. This is just the beginning. Let's do something, that, let's do something better than this. One thing we can do now, actually, let me just keep that one P for now, is I have in my request a slash hello and a slash hello something. I don't want to keep doing multiple if and else. I want this to be more seamless. It could be a dictionary, it could be something else. We have something for this called event handler. So the event handler, the way what it does is, let me just get this one here. It's similar to the other utilities. I can just do API gateway resolver. And then within here, I can use decorators to annotate which part exactly in my code I'm gonna handle this route. So I can say both are get, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, both are get. So if I just do app.get and I say this function is hello and I can do exactly the same, except that I no longer need those JSON. I no longer need a bunch of things. So I can just remove this piece now. In fact, I can even remove this line. If I always wanted to do this for debugging purpose only, I can say log event, True, so now one last line. And because I need to do the routing resolution to know which function I should go, I need to resolve uh, this event that's coming. So all I need to do uh, now is up. Winter, I'm gonna, sorry, I have to cut you off, but there's like a strange effect on the screen that uh, like you changed the tab a couple of times and now we can see uh, the screen is kind of chopped in a way. So I can more or less see what you're showing, but it's not perfect. Oh. Can I, okay. um, I will maybe remove your screen share and uh, we try again and see if it's, it fixes it, all right? Sure. Because like it was just um, distracting to look at. Uh, no, nobody mentioned oh, it in the sorry. chat, but I'm being, uh, I'm being proactive here. No okay, problem, so. thank you. Uh, so I removed the, still the same thing. Can you um, uh, so like stop, hang on stop a second. sharing and then share again? Maybe that's that? Yeah, I can try to use a 5G. If that makes, maybe try, maybe that's it. Uh, uh, yeah, 
Maybe. Uh, I'm not sure if it's internet or StreamYard being naughty. Bruno is saying wrap the text, uh, but we um, we had some bits from the site as well. So it wasn't just the VS code mm. uh, being weird. OK, got it. I think. I think that fixed it, uh, and if I if I didn't, I will pipe up, uh, pipe up again. I'm sorry to have disturbed your, uh, uh, no, your problem. Flow, but, no problem. No problem. Uh, all right. Um, okay. See you later. Let me let me, <laughs> <laughs> no let, me uh, let me take a step back. Uh, what I was trying to show, I'm not sure which part. When did it start to show an issue? But I'm gonna walk you through the code. So let me just finish this real quick. I would say that this is going to be a hello. So what we were doing before, if you couldn't uh, follow, is we initially imported tracer logger, tracer and metrics. We initialized that. And then we run a request to see how that would look like in X-Ray, in traces, in logging, and metadata, and things like this. This is also on GitHub, by the way. I'm going to show you on GitHub in a second. And what we are doing now, what we're doing the last five minutes, in case the screen was a bit buggy or blurry, is we imported something called Event Handler. We have this for both REST APIs, so API Gateway REST, API Gateway HTTP, and also ALB. And we also have that for App Sync in the GraphQL space. So the, what the Resolver does is going to be annotating functions that are going to be acting as my route. So if you're coming from frameworks like Django, Flask, and, and things alike, you're going to feel at home here, or Chalice as well for AWS. And the last piece I was trying to do to show you how it would look like is I, I, I don't have any idea how to route the request until I receive the event. So it has to happen at runtime. So what I'm doing is I'm saying resolve this particular event and this particular Lambda context. And this allows me to have access to that particular event so I can get the body as JSON, the body as decoded uh, in case it's a binary, the headers, HTTP methods, or query strings, or any other methods that can make it easier for me to manipulate that data in ways we already know. And this, by the way, was contributed by a person called Michael Brewer. He did pretty much all the work. So let's try this now and see if this works. And if it does, we can try to change, let's say this to you, hello universe. So I'm going to go back to the watch. It's building for me and done. So if I try again, I should see hello universe not found. Ah, I see what's not found because I have a hello slash and not just a hello. So if I hello now, works. So if I go to my logs, everything else should continue to run with the additional log events. Nothing else changed for that purpose. If I now do exactly the same for Let's say hello you. I now have that name of that person. So I can do this is gonna be a string because it's a browser. So I can say, for I'm instance, sorry, that this with me again. Oh no. And I hate <laughs> voice. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, you know, it's a little bit better, but it hasn't been fixed. And uh Paul okay. says so, uh perhaps it might work to only share the VS Code app window install instead of the whole screen. Uh, Jose mm. says, yeah, it seems the problem persists. Sometimes turning the camera off helps me when that happens. So how okay. about we try, um, how about we try with only the um, sharing the app instead of the, uh, instead of the whole screen? Let me, let, you know what, let me try 5G. I, just to be triple sure. Okay. Hang on a second with me. <laughs> let me switch. Sure. Uh, Udai also says in the chat that it's possibly uh, possibly internet issue. I hope it's something that can be fixed and not just my tool uh, being naughty and failing me when I'm in need. Paul says, thank you for being proactive. Thank you, Paul. You seem to have something nice to say to every occasion like that. How does it work in now? Any better? I mean, you look great. You always did. It's the, it's the screen that's misbehaving. Okay. So let's uh, let's try the share uh, mm -hmm. and uh, hope for a good result. It wouldn't be a live stream if something didn't go bad. So um, <laughs> yeah. we, we are prepared. Nerves of steel. Okay. <laughs> yeah, happens. I don't know. 
So who, uh, Paul, you were seeing that issue before and also a few others. How is that looking like now? So this is on the 5G now, no yeah, Wi-Fi. Yeah, well, I mean, I can, uh, I can see a little bit of your browser peering through the, uh, peering through the VS code. Uh, is it already the um, uh, sharing the uh, app or is it uh, the whole screen? I understand that sharing the whole screen is not perfect because you have to switch a lot, yeah? Yeah, hang on. Um, but it's okay. I, I can stick with, with the Visual Studio Code only. Let's see if that's any any better. Uh, looks okay for now. Let's, uh, let's try to move around a little bit. I'm hoping that this is the last time I have to make this interruption. Uh, no problem. It's also no heartbreaking problem. to me. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. See you in a moment. Paul, how is it looking like now for people in the chat? Can you see it now? Is it still blurry? 50%? I'm actually zooming 75%, so, okay, all oh, good. <laughs> I'll try again. I promise next month I should have fiber in my new place. I'm living in the countryside now, so. I don't have my one gigabyte internet as I used to, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, okay. I was showing you that we can have a routing function now just by annotating with that dot get, dot post, dot anything we like. And we just added a new one now called uh, slash hello and that particular name. And because I do this, because this is coming from the path and not a query string, this will automatically be injected into my function as a string in this case. And then I can simply do as I please. So if I try to do another request and try to say Natalia, for instance, let's see, works. So if I try Alec or try anybody else, I should, it should be able to work. The idea here is that it should be much easier for you to do these things and not having to go to back and forth in the documentation for a lot of things. And this is just the basics of Lambda Power Tools. There's a lot more into it. I can act like I mentioned before, I could even say if I want to have access to the query strings, I should be able to say current event, get a specific query string, a specific header, insensitive or not, or all of them at once give me only the JSON body. There's a lot of methods, a lot of stuff in here to make your life easier. How, when do you go from here? So this is just the basics of the Lambda Power Tools, yet super powerful. You can prototype an application in, in so much faster now, in, in like in record time. I can do this in seconds as opposed to weeks now. This is the main page of the Lambda Power Tools in the GitHub. This is available under AWS Labs. AWS Lambda Power Tools dash the runtime. It's going to be one for Python, one for Java, and one for TypeScript. The type, the Python one, has been the longest. So you're going to see more features. We go from, let me just zoom in a bit. We also have a tutorial if you want to do exactly like I just did, but in more details. So if you're new to Lambda Power Tools, there's an example on going from scratch, one feature at a time, why this is the case, what's the value in it, and yada, 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 and what you could do next. We also have the roadmap in a central place and more features in there. If I were to go, for instance, on one of the most popular features is batch processing. If you are using SQS for queuing mechanisms, DynamoDB streams for doing uh, data change capture, for instance, or if you're trying to do uh, kinesis for telemetry or any sort of a stream-based processing, what this does is in the same vein or the same nature of using a decorator, you will initialize a batch processor. So say event type.sqs, kinesis, it doesn't matter. You define a function that will receive a record at a time. We will automatically do the typing for you and you should be able to auto-complete everything else plus a few utilities like I just showed you for API Gateway, also for AppSync and so forth. And then you add a specific decorator to when the request come in from SQS, Kinesis, et cetera, we take the entire batch, we call your function one at a time, and then at the response, you basically return it. 
what this means to you is if there's any partial failure, and that's part of the serverless lens best practices, we will be able to catch that particular failure and return to SQS Kinesis and say, only these records failed. Everything else, carry on. This means you don't necessarily have to retry those particular messages that succeeded. Then we can go from validation of those payloads. We have event source data classes. We have dependency. We have a parser, feature flags. We have JSON, uh, James path to handle JSON differently as it comes. There's a lot more here. This is one of my favorites is, let me show you the last part of the presentation, is idempotency. Imagine you have a request that, that came, say for a payment or ingesting loyalty or processing an order. Sometimes your downstream backend cannot process an order more than once or something more than once. Because if it is, you don't want to charge your customers more than twice or refund your customers more than twice. So what this does, it follows the best practices from the Amazon Builders Library and incorporates engine utility that all you need to do is you import my dependency, a persistence layer. At the moment, we use DynamoDB, but we are looking to add Redis as well. And the function called idempotent. And it, it works for Lambda handlers and also for any synchronous functions uh, available in Python. What we do is you say, I'm going to initialize my persistence layer, in this case, DynamoDB, and I'm going to create a configuration for uh, this dependency. So I'm going to have to say where in my payload that I'm receiving is unique. If I send a request twice and they, for instance, and the user ID if an authorization is the same and the body of the payload is exactly the same, then I know that the request was retried more than once. So, and we use caching memory. It's disabled by default because we don't know how much memory you have available and how many requests you receive concurrently. Once you configure these two pieces, the storage layer where we're going to store the dependency tokens and the configuration, how to handle these things, where exactly in the payload, you just do this. You do exactly the same as the other parts of, of Power Tools. You wrap with an, of a decorator. And the next time the request comes in, we go to DynamoDB, save the request in there. If the request comes again, we return it directly from memory or from DynamoDB if you don't use uh, that all the hard pieces of what if I receive multiple requests at the same time? What if the payload slightly change? What if I have a timeout or what if I have X? We handle all these things. If you are curious about these things in general, we have a part of the documentation called I dependency request flow. We have all of these things documented. We spend a lot of time and the documentation of, of power tools. There's still so much work that we have to do yet is not perfect. But in every part of the documentation, you should always see a getting started. Say you never used this before, first time using this utility, advanced, you already know how to use or you have edge cases. And then lastly, how do I test my code? Now that I just added power tools, maybe my unit test would change. Maybe I wanna use ports and adapters, you name it. So we always try to document those things in here. I could go on and show you more logs and show you more pieces, but that should be a quick introduction to where we are with Power Tools, why we created it, and where we're going. There's still a lot more features to add, circuit breakers, more documentation, and potentially in the future, once we have more time, start describing what feature would look like and hear from the community what are the features that we should add in version two, and packet size, you know, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> uh, I tried to make this as fast as I could because I know we're, we're past the time, but I hopefully uh, that gave you a good idea what it is. Apologies for the internet connection issue. I hope I made up for it a bit. And thank you everyone for coming. And more importantly, thank you, Natalia, for helping hosting all these things and I'm seeing all of it. I know how hard it is. Oh my, oh my, thank, thank you very you. much. I am I am back uh, Ator, this time with no bad news. Uh, this time to uh, this time to thank you uh, for your wonderful expertise. No worries about the technical issues at all. We live, we learn. So uh, yeah. let's see if we have uh, let's see if we have some questions. Uh, we do I have a specific question from John. Uh, 
Uh, John is asking, does Lambda Power Tools support uh, CloudWatch alarms or what is the best way to create alarms? We don't do alarms because that's on the infrastructure side. <clears throat> In Lambda Power Tools, we separate runtime and infrastructure. We want you to use the infrastructure tooling you prefer the most. It could be CDK, it could be serverless framework, it could be Cloud.js, it could be SAM, it could be anything. So you, you have to create those alarms uh, within that infrastructure. If you need guidance on what sort of alarms you create, in the first question of Lambda Power to uh, well architected serverless lens in the operational pillar, we ask you whether you know which alarms you create. And if you don't, we give you, I think, nearly 40 <laughs> suggestions on here's where to start at the very least. So it's there. But no, we don't cover in Lambda Power Tools for now. All right, everybody wants to see the GitHub. Um, yes, it is. And um, let me send you the link so you can send to people. Yes, thank you very much. A uh, question from Udai. I think the last one for today. We still have the raffle announcement to make, and then we can go home. Uh, Udai is asking any timelines on .NET Power Tools. Not that I can say. At the moment, we're working hard to try to get this in the first semester. Uh, that's the best I can say. We still have people working hard onto this. Um, at the moment, the main the main it's not a team behind Lambda Power Tools at the moment. We have different people, different volunteers across AWS uh, trying to get this out. That's why we have uh, different feature parity and we also have different timelines. So .NET, it's almost there. We just need to make sure we have the performance rights so it doesn't impact your application. But once it's out, it will be in beta first because we need to hear your feedback. But you will have at the very least the, the tracer, the metrics, and the logger, which I'm actually looking at the docs now, and I wish I could show you. <laughs> Very cool. Um, what else? Well, there's a lot going on in the chat. Alex is being a joker. Uh, I think I think uh, I think I can say bye to you, Ator. And uh, yeah, I was looking forward to uh, to chatting with you again. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much again. Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay, and uh, now uh, we are on to the last part of the meetup, which is the raffle announcements. Let me add my let me add my screen here. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, I put all the names uh, that were entered in the Thai form through a randomizer tool. I have recorded my screen while doing that, uh, so that in case uh, in case you want to see that the. Uh, the raffle is legit. You can ask me and I'll show you this recording. Uh, so yeah, on to the winners. The serverless applications with Node.js book goes to Aaron Vaka and uh, Daniel Zivkovic. I think I've seen Daniel in the chat, actually. He said that he lives in Toronto. Uh, next, a serverless architecture on AWS. This book goes to Stefanka and Kevin. Congratulations. Very lucky. And uh, the last uh, the last prize of the meetup is the AppSync Masterclass, the uh, the um, the course that we've been mentioning pretty much the entire meetup, and that goes to Lucas. Congratulations, Lucas! Uh, so yeah, please expect an email uh, from me uh, that will have the details on how to claim your prize. And with that, our meetup is coming to an end. I would like to thank the wonderful speakers, so Jan, Alex, and Aitor for their great, great expertise, as well as Anil, so the main organizer of the Serverless Berlin meetup. And uh, yeah, he made it all possible. Also, Radmila from uh, Manning Publications, uh, she, has, she has been a huge help uh, when preparing for this meetup, so definitely deserves a big shout out. And finally, a big thank you to the audience as well. And uh, I am hoping to see you again uh, very, very soon for the next serverless Berlin meetup. And yeah, that's a wrap. Bye-bye.